Thank you very much for the warm welcome and uh, that intro, Brock. Thanks for setting the table. And uh, can we have a big hand for everyone who cooked our food and served it, made this a great meal together. So uh, it's such an honor to be here. Uh, merci tout le monde. C'est un plaisir énorme d'être parmi vous uh, aujourd'hui. And thank you for bringing me here to talk with you today. There's, uh, there's nothing more inspiring than joining a group of people who are grappling with uh, a huge source of injustice and suffering in our country and tackling huge challenges, uh, righting great wrongs, healing great suffering. This is, uh, is work that is worthy of a lifetime's dedication and this room is full of, of many dedicated lifetimes and uh, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for all of your commitment and dedication to this work. Uh, it means the world uh, to me to be uh, here and, and uh, be able to share the story uh, that work we've done in Vancouver over these past uh, number of years. Um, and I want to start first uh, by thanking Tim Richter, who's, um, who's done great work, uh, inspired many of us, certainly inspired us in Vancouver. We, we've really appreciated your leadership, and I know that's true for cities and towns right across the country. You've been a great advocate for this work and, uh, and a catalyst for uh, bringing us all together. Thanks, Tim. Give Tim a hand, please. So it's, it's a little daunting uh, to be up here and to share uh, experience from Vancouver with a room full of people with so much experience, with, um, with so, much, uh, so many ideas, so much compassion, tenacity, maybe a little bit of cynicism which is totally understandable. Uh, it's okay. As a politician, we talk a lot about, we say the word challenge a lot. Um, this project is a challenge. This decision was challenging. Homelessness is a huge challenge. And it's a challenge that has defined my political life like no other. And that's where I'd like to start today, uh, starting with how we take a seemingly impossible challenge, an issue uh, to try and solve like homelessness, and not just get it on the agenda, but to lift it to the top of a political agenda. And how we combine then innovation and persistence, partnership and boldness to create street level change, to change that, that can dramatically transform the lives of people for the better. When I first ran uh, for mayor, no factor played a greater role for me. Uh, it, there was this immense contradiction between the affluence and the beauty of Vancouver and the number of people living and suffering on our streets. And back in 2008, homelessness was, was reaching a crisis point, and yet it barely seemed to register on City Hall's political radar. And the catalyst for me running for mayor was Daryl McCaskill. And Daryl and his sweetheart, Pam, were sleeping in an alley a couple blocks from City Hall. Uh, this winter was uh, full force. Uh, they had tried to get into a, a shelter that was full uh, a few blocks away and had bundled up in their sleeping bags. Uh, fire uh, caught their sleeping bags on fire and, and Daryl didn't make it. Pam survived with severe burns all over her body. What really pushed me over the edge was that there was no reaction from the mayor at the time, uh, even the premier, that uh, hardly much mentioned in the media as well. That We'd gotten so hardened uh, as a city that, um, that there wasn't an outpouring of, of outrage and grief. And instead, what I saw from political leadership was uh, a combination of apathy and even resignation. And that, at the time, a prevailing opinion, I think, was, was that we try and limit the damage, that we try and, and um, you know, minimize the impact on the community, maybe even hide people from the tourists, big industry tourism. The Olympics were coming to town two years from then. I didn't get into politics. I was elected as an MLA at that point in, in the BC, uh, in the opposition caucus. Uh, I didn't get into politics to be a caretaker. And uh, so for me, it was, uh, this was not okay. It was not okay in politics to lower expectations, to manage the status quo. I got into it because I felt I had something to offer that could make a difference. And I, I have no doubt that that's what drives many of uh, you in this room. 
In November 2008, I was elected as mayor following a campaign where I put homelessness front and center, committed to ending street homelessness by 2015, and voters responded, electing me and nine out of 10 councillors who were committed to that, that promise. The day after we were sworn in as council, we launched the Homeless Emergency Action Team, or HEAT. And there are, there are a couple members of, uh, of the HEAT team here uh, tonight, uh, today. Patrick Stewart, uh, Janice Abbott, Shane Ramsey, uh, at least a number of city staff who were, were closely involved. And we set to it right off the bat. And, and I, I strongly believe that this shouldn't be a surprise. To solve a problem, you put a team together that has expertise, that has passion, that has knowledge of how to solve an issue. And um, community uh, and government leaders who have the clout to make that shift and, and make the on-the-ground connections to make things happen quickly and uh, the expertise to make them happen well. So we, uh, after our first uh, HEAT team meeting, and this was uh, the chief medical officer, uh, the chief of police, housing advocates, uh, service providers, at the core of the HEAT team was the city's legendary homeless outreach lead, and that's Judy Graves, who uh, had taken me out for some very late nights, shared her wisdom and insights with me as I geared up to run for mayor. She is here and, and she really deserves huge kudos for her inspiration and leadership from the streets and shelters. So after our first heat team meeting, it was really clear that, that one urgent action needed to take place above all else and that was to open more shelters. Go figure. Uh, but not only to do that, but to do that in a different way from what was in currently in place. We wanted the shelters to be low barrier so that people uh, who were vulnerable on the streets uh, could come in, those who hadn't come in for years. And that uh, apparently was an innovation, although it felt more like common sense at the time. That was uh, the only way we figured we could get hundreds of people in uh, off the streets as the winter was bearing down on us. So the shelters opened and they opened quickly. And they had to, uh, you stereos, Types aside, uh, we do have winter in Vancouver. Uh, not quite what you see elsewhere in Canada, but this one in 2008, 2009 was shaping up to be a bitterly cold one. And that is, as we know, a life and death proposition if you're on the streets. So that meant we had to move uh, with, without the kind of community dialogue that I would have liked, uh, would have liked to have. We knew there would be some controversy, and there was uh, over time with the shelters because there's no question there's, there can be some local impact depending on where they are and how they fit within the community. But lives were saved in that winter that saw almost six weeks of record snow and cold in Vancouver. And we learned some lessons from that very early on. We learned that it was important to operate these low barrier shelters 24 hours a day so that people weren't going out, back out into the street in the morning and lining up for hours uh, in the afternoon and evening. Uh, we learned that providing uh, food would be critical to stabilizing people, from the immediate calming influence uh, on blood sugar and, and the ability to get some sleep at night to the, to the dramatic improvements in health that we saw uh, over time, over several months' time. We learned that accepting the inconvenience of pets and carts, uh, accommodating couples and people who weren't sober but were calm and respectful uh, would make a huge difference. And it allowed us to welcome in the hardest to house from our streets and helped us build some invaluable trust and some real sense of community in these shelters. So in five years uh, since the winter of 2008, our winter shelters have helped uh, about 500 people move from the streets through the shelters and into permanent housing. And that, uh, what looked at the time like a, 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 a band-aid solution, a quick solution, uh, ended up becoming an innovative uh, common practice that saved lives. And those are pretty basic measures, uh, but they made a big difference. They, as you saw, we, they've, uh, we've seen a big drop in street homelessness thanks to those innovations and many others. And, and to extend into some of those others, um, I'll talk about a few other things. We bought up uh, a number of old hotels, turned them into what we call interim housing as, as permanent housing gets built. Again, these are partnerships, the city and the province and community uh, groups, uh, some of our, our best and brightest that have helped us create these um, housing opportunities, they've really bridged the gap between the shelters and the permanent housing that's coming on stream. We've had some amazing innovative ideas uh, from the community. Uh, one 
example I'll throw out there as, as we get into the more permanent housing options, Atira Women's Resource Society, which does incredible work with some of the most vulnerable and marginalized women in Canada, has recently converted shipping containers, those big, cold, huge steel boxes that, that travel the high seas, into bright, warm, welcoming homes in Vancouver's downtown east side. And, and thanks to Janice Abbott, who was part of the HEAT team as well for her relentless leadership with the TIRA and delivering uh, really creative solutions like this. Innovation uh, can also mean uh, borrowing ideas from the best. And we, um, we put a team together, uh, a task force on affordability that um, there are a few other people at Mark Guzlitz, one a board member of the Alliance here, uh, was part of as well. Looking at ideas, fresh ideas, ideas from around the country that would help us get more uh, housing built, whether it's interim or more permanent, just more creative solutions on the table. And, uh, and we've seen some, uh, some advances on that. Brock uh, gave one example of a, a big partnership for a number of city-owned sites and really leveraging city assets, uh, building uh, housing with the YWCA for women and children, young families that are at risk of homelessness on top of a new library in Strathcona. Uh, looking at an opportunity on a fire hall now, above the fire hall. So we're, we're really looking at every asset of the city and how we can utilize that for affordable housing. And a, a double, or as our city manager Penny Ballum says, a triple word score. We also uh, have borrowed some ideas from, uh, from south of the border, New York City. We took a, an idea of a, a rental standards database from New York City. They, they put it more in the frame of uh, going after the slumlords. We're a little more gentle on that language in Vancouver. Uh, this actually came, uh, was sponsored by Bill de Blasio, who was uh, formerly New York City's public advocate. He's now the Democratic candidate for mayor of New York City, uh, expected to be the next mayor of New York, I think in most uh, circles. And we adapted that database to Vancouver's needs, basically putting fire and building safety data online, giving tenants uh, an easy to use database so they could understand uh, what kind of buildings they were moving into, uh, open data site type approach, and, uh, and enabling people to make more informed choices and, and kind of raising the bar on uh, rental housing across the city that those lower standards were not going to compete and not attract tenants. So we've, we've deployed a number of innovative ideas uh, across the continuum of housing from those low barrier shelters to ensuring that, that we're getting rental housing built. Uh, and. Uh, I think that's a reason that we're advancing at this point, uh, filling the gaps right along the continuum. So I want to speak about partnerships, and I, I know we've, we use this word all the time, but it, it does uh, have to be said how important some of these partnerships and some of the really creative ones that we've put together. We, we've, we've worked really hard to put different groups together and, uh, and have some successful, tangible results come from that as quickly as possible. One, uh, one interesting collaboration that's, uh, that's about to come together again is bringing uh, faith leaders, our churches, uh, synagogues, mosques, temples, uh, bringing them all together at late fall is typically when we've done this to get their ideas and, and cross-pollination. Who's doing what? What services are they providing? They've collectively provided an enormous array of services and support for the community. And uh, we found by bringing them together, and, and we've had some pretty passionate and, and even rambunctious meetings, We've ended up getting some, uh, some ac added value from that. So we've, got, we've got some new programs, uh, new uh, innovative steps taken as they collaborate on, uh, on steps to support the community. It's also been uh, really important to work with the business community. And uh, we've, we've had a great partnership with the Street to Home Foundation, which uh, is represented here uh, by President and CEO Rob Turnbull, who's done a, a great job. I want to recognize Rob for the work he's done with his team to raise tens of millions of dollars from the business community, from philanthropy, put private dollars on the table to help leverage the city and the province uh, and the federal government uh, to get on with the show. And uh, they've really been a great catalyst in that. And uh, a, a big outcome, whether it's actual buildings that we've partnered on, uh, that they've uh, helped push the pace with to the Vancouver Rent Bank, which has now finished its first year of operation. and and help prevent, uh, in the first year, 228 people from losing their homes. So a great, great success on the rent bank. Again, another idea borrowed from, uh, from some other places. I also need to recognize the partnership that we've had with the BC government. The Minister of Housing, Rich Coleman, and uh, the CEO of BC Housing, Shane Ramsey, have been extraordinary partners. And their deep commitment to advancing this work and stepping up with really critical investments when we needed them the most uh, has made all the difference, whether it's from shelters to re renovating uh, the SROs and, and the existing uh, low-cost 
housing to, uh, to building all the new supportive housing, the 14 sites, over 1,500 units of supportive housing that were well on our way uh, to opening. So they've moved uh, over these past five years, providing those resources to help end street homelessness, and really to also look broader at, the, um, at solving the overall homelessness epidemic. And I'm, uh, there's more to do, as Brock said. We're, we're not done yet. We've managed to get things stabilized, and I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, our new, newly elected premier will follow through and will commit to the goals uh, of, of putting those resources on the table so that we can actually solve this. So over the years to come, we actually achieve those goals of ending street homelessness by 2015 and, and our 10-year goal, which is pushes to 2021 to eradicate homelessness as we know it across the province, ideally. So that's, uh, that's something that we're committed to, to matching at the city, matching with our uh, more humble uh, resources and, and tax uh, revenue supply. We've, at this point, we're working on a, a, an unprecedented $60 million capital budget. We inserted that in our, our current capital plan, which has never really happened before in Vancouver, but we felt the circumstances were dire and, and grave enough that we needed to uh, allocate capital dollars uh, from property taxpayers and, and parking meters and, and dedicate some of that in good faith. We're leveraging a lot more than that from the province, whose primary responsibility it is, but we're putting city resources on the table in every way that we can. The missing ingredient, uh, uh, I think all too often for us and probably for many of you, is the federal government. Uh, many, many years of decline uh, in the funding for housing, affordable housing across Canada. Uh, a dramatic decline the, this year, it, it adds up to $660 million, less money than there would be on the table if that decline hadn't happened over 25 years. Um, and, and it's puzzling because we've had some extraordinary partnerships with the federal government that, that that we're, we're just seeing the results of now. And, and uh, I'll speak to the At Home Chez Soi project, which you know, there's lots of connections in the room on this front. A partnership with the Mental Health Commission of Canada. Uh, we've had uh, fantastic results from uh, housing and giving uh, mental health care to hundreds of people in Vancouver. Uh, we've seen great results uh, on this front. Uh, it, it's proven how effective the housing first approach can be. Uh, with the appropriate supports, and uh, those are absolutely essential to it. But we've seen emergency room visits plummet. We've seen uh, improved health outcomes. Perhaps most importantly, I think we've seen participants saying they have a real much stronger sense of community and belonging in the city. And that's uh, big kudos to all the people at the Mental Health Commission of Canada and the government of Canada, everyone associated with the At Home Chez Soi project, who have proved uh, what I think we all knew going in was almost certain to happen, but it's been a great result. So really, it's proof positive that uh, the, the role the federal government can play uh, in tackling this crisis can be dramatic if uh, th those commitments are real and they're long term. So we remain hopeful. Good to see some dollars uh, firmed up for Housing First in this, uh, this last budget. But there's a lot more to go on that front. And I think if we're going to address this as a country, we have to have the federal government's leadership on it. This year, as uh, many of us know, the f that, f that funding will expire, and, and although we have the provincial government stepping up for the short term to make up the difference, we do have the prospect of many people uh, vulnerable and actually pushed back out on the street uh, because of a lack of support in that program, and that would be a, a terrible tragedy. But I want to make clear uh, that this is not just about Vancouver, it's about Canada, and the, and the issues that we face in Vancouver uh, are not unlike the ones that I hear from mayors across the country whether it's uh, Mayor Nenshi in Calgary, Mayor Savage in Halifax, Mayor Watson here in, in Ottawa. I hear the same stories. I, I hear the same uh, challenges uh, from, uh, from those mayors. Uh, and and, and it, the same stories keep repeating themselves regardless of what province we're in. So we can't kid ourselves. This is a national issue. And the costs of, uh, of homelessness span the entire budget spectrum from uh, criminal justice and policing to healthcare and, and the housing costs. And it crosses issues of uh, ideology, the whole spectrum, the, the party lines, the boundaries of jurisdiction. So the failure to address this is really a failure to steward taxpayer dollars, and it's uh, really selling our communities and our country short. Whether that's municipal, provincial, or federal, it does not matter. We need to do this. So it's, it is disheartening to see uh, the, the federal government's uh, retreat over the past few decades and we can only be hopeful 
with 650 people here and all the networks we're connected to, that we make this a political priority federally. We make sure that housing dollars are protected in the next federal budget, and we make sure it's an election issue in the next federal election. <laughs> and I, I, I will just speak uh, to the to the current frame of reference uh, that many budget decisions and many political decisions are made, and that is the economic realities of it. The Bank of Canada recently uh, put out a list of uh, the domestic risks to our economy, and number one on that list was imbalance in housing. And uh, we know that that, in this room, we know that's the whole gamut from those who are on the street and homeless to people on the low to middle incomes who can't afford, will never be able to afford to buy a place and can't find uh, affordable rental housing. So that, that's putting our country at great risk and the Bank of Canada, uh, a, a fairly conservative and, uh, and shrewd body, uh, august body in our country is, has made a clear statement on that. So hopefully in that economic frame even, if, it, if we have to reduce it to that, we can see change made. One in four Canadians right now is paying more than 30% of their income. That, that definition of affordable housing. More and more people can't sustain that. Uh, we're obviously seeing uh, real estate and, and property values continue to out outstrip the increase in any earnings and take home pay. And, and so this is a nationwide challenge. Over 200,000 Canadians experience homelessness every year from the, from the Alliance's study. Over 30,000 people homeless on any given night. The stats are, uh, are bewildering. 150,000 people in Ontario waiting for affordable housing. 3,000 in Calgary, 4,100 in Vancouver right now, 3,000 in Waterloo. These are big numbers and, uh, and, and shocking if you actually think of it, uh, uh, the impact that that has on families and communities across the country. Not only big cities, small towns, resource towns under great pressure right now, uh, that those similar pressures, sometimes even worse with the boom and bust cycles that, uh, that can be uh, enormous pressure on incomes and enormous challenges on real estate. Uh, and, and it's very difficult to serve populations in, in uh, remote areas in that respect. So again, that's, um, that's why Ottawa needs to be at the table. That's why, as Brock uh, said, the Feder Federation of Canadian Municipalities have launched this campaign and this top priority on housing and uh, homelessness, making sure that, uh, that we see a commitment from the federal government not only to protect those dollars, but to put together a long-term plan for our country to ensure that we have, uh, we address the dangerous imbalances in the housing sector and, and that we eradicate homelessness. That, uh, that's what we will be pushing for uh, as mayors and councillors and uh, regional directors, uh, elected officials across the country and, and uh, our teams, we will be pushing hard on this uh, for the uh, months and years ahead. And I, I wanna speak to, to a word that may also get overused in the rest of all of this, and that is boldness. It's ultimately a question of political leadership, whether the resources are allocated from uh, our collective tax dollars. And I think these solutions are about being bold. And there's no question that we can't end homelessness without being bold at this point. This is a, a very difficult problem for us to solve. I think the people of our city understand uh, that these are, are tough issues and that they're, they're gonna stick with politicians who uh, stick with um, and, and, and earn their trust, that, that stick to their guns on this. And I personally now have gone to the electorate twice with an explicit promise and commitment that this will be my top priority, solving homelessness. And the voters have responded. I, I somehow got back in uh, two years ago. I've got a year to go in this term, uh, and I expect to keep on keeping on. The, um, the, cam the campaign commitments, the, um, the resistance, the pushback that, that does get met with, I think uh, has to be taken a step further. And that, that political leadership does need to extend to make clear that our city staff, the, the people who are all too often on the front lines and, and on, on the, uh, the friction, uh, the, the edge with all that friction, uh, need serious backup when they're at open houses, when they're at community meetings, when they're, uh, when they're out there dealing with those front lines, it can be very, very difficult. Council meetings can be very difficult. And so when times are tough, it's, it's essential that elected officials are behind our, our staff at the city. And uh, that's support that, that uh, just needs to happen. We're not just behind them, 
but we're in the same room. I'm, I'm honored to be here with a number of our great city staff from the city of Vancouver who've been uh, champions on all this and who have certainly taken their lumps on the front lines uh, and, and deserve full credit for that. Brenda Proskin, Celine Maboulis is, are both here. Uh, our new chief housing officer, Mukhtar Latif, uh, as I said, Judy Graves is here as well. And, and uh, thank you to them uh, for, and for you for being on the front lines and, uh, and covering my back in many, many cases. Uh, also, our city manager, Penny Ballum, Dr. Penny Ballum, who's, uh, who's been tireless on this, leading the city and the 10,000 staff. And, um, and in some cities, this would be unlikely, but our police chief, uh, Chief Jim Chu, and, and the VPD team have been uh, remarkably supportive uh, of this work as well on the front lines and recognizing work, working upstream is absolutely essential to their work to, uh, to make our city safer. So I'm, I'm blessed to have such an incredible team to work with at the city. And I know that's the case in, in uh, many other cities. Uh, if the political leadership is there, there will be the, the staff support and, and the incredible depth of expertise ready at the, and, and able to take on that challenge. I do want to speak um, to going uh, beyond, and this has been a really difficult piece for us uh, in Vancouver, looking beyond uh, the just the, the beds, the roofs overhead, uh, the housing is urgently important, but I want just speak to the, to the next step of this that, that we're grappling with, and that is with mental health care. And making sure that we, that we set aside the mental health and addiction, the wedge issues that can be uh, very difficult to uh, navigate, the stigma that can be a real challenge, and look at the uh, uh, honest situation on the ground. We know that a third of Vancouver's homeless population is struggles with addiction, and about half is uh, suffering from a mental, mental illness. And that means uh, if we're going to solve homelessness, we need a commitment that the men, women, and children and youth, really important with, on the children and youth side, uh, that suffer from, from very um, disabling mental illnesses get the support that they need. We have gaps in our social and health safety nets that will only lead to more people in the streets. And I, when we op open the, uh, the shelters in Vancouver, uh, they don't just uh, deal with people, the forces that push people into homelessness. One of the reasons that At Home was so successful was that it provided what was missing, and that was support for mental health. And we need to address that issue. Um, it's not often mixed with homelessness. I think there's been a, a fear of, of overlap and, and confusing the issues. But uh, we're, we're in a, a very difficult crisis now with people with very severe mental illnesses who are getting no treatment. And the lack of treatment for, uh, for thousands of people in, the, uh, in Vancouver is, is uh, an enormous challenge that we have to tackle at the same time as the housing piece. And uh, that's going to be an essential piece. Uh, so it's beyond just the, the bricks and mortar, making sure the health care is there, making sure the food is there. Uh, we, we have a healthy city strategy now and that puts food at the center and make sure that people have the nutrition and the support that they need to recover from uh, physical illnesses as well. So that's, a, that, that's another key piece here. We, we, looking beyond just uh, the walls and, and roof overhead that, uh, that we provide those services that are absolutely critical. I, and that's no surprise, I know in this room, I'm, I'm, uh, I know it's well recognized, but delivering that on the ground has been, uh, has been spotty across the country and there remain big, big gaps. And I just wanna, wanna speak to one, one final point related to this boldness thing. And that is um, the question of, it's not just alleviating the suffering and meeting basic needs. I think there's, there's something about recognizing the cost to our community when we lose people, when we lose the contribution that they can make and the tremendous gains that are possible when that contribution uh, is real and, and comes back to the table. I'll tell a little story about our, our Vision Park Board Chair, Sarah Blythe. She helped launch a street soccer program five years ago. And at first it was, it was really a question of gently encouraging people uh, from the shelter to get on the bus, come to the gym, uh, learn some, some soccer fundamentals. In many cases, people played soccer in their, in their youth, hadn't for years, getting back into it, get some exercise, play a team sport, have some fun. But it, it very quickly became much, much more. There's now a, a web of community in Vancouver, our street soccer league. We've seen lives transformed. Uh, one man, a, good, a friend of mine named Patrick, who I think his picture is up, up on the screen here. Patrick came to the game three years ago uh, where, where he and his teammates played against me and, uh, and some of my city council and city staff. It wasn't a pretty game. 
I, but just the fact that the, we were that we were there and knobby knees and all, I, I think said um, said volumes about our commitment. He uh, marks that game as a turning point in his life. He went on to become uh, the captain of Team Canada at the Homeless uh, World Cup in Br Homeless Soccer World Cup in Brazil. Uh, he came back and started his own team in Vancouver, Woodward's FC, and raised the funds for uniforms himself. And now he works part-time for our pro soccer team in the MLS, the Vancouver Whitecaps. And when, when that team went to Brazil, I think you should know that their first matches were devastating. They got, they got cleaned. I, you know, Brazilian homeless people are actually good soccer players. <laughs> and they had an edge. But our, our team uh, really rallied. They, they ended up being the, the most, most sportsmanlike team of, of the tournament for their spirit in that tournament on the beaches of Rio. Uh, they, uh, they had a level of resilience that I think stunned everyone, that any pro team would, uh, would be proud to claim for their own. And a year or two later, the Canadian women's team lit up Paris uh, at, at their World Cup, bringing First Nations singing and uh, a, a contagious team spirit that really became the talk of the tournament. So this, this has been transformative for, for everyone involved in it, and, and the rest of Vancouver really has celebrated these great victories and, and risen up to support the team. The Whitecaps turned out to, to give big send-offs when our teams have gone off to these homeless World Cups. Local media have been uh, enormously supportive as well. And it's more than goodwill. It's, uh, it's a celebration of achievement and a recognition of possibility. And that recognition, I think, can be transformative for all of us. I, I think, ultimately, boldness is challenging our community to acknowledge that there's a responsibility that was always there, and not to accept homelessness as an inevitability, not to just manage it as an intractable problem, but to end homelessness as a fundamental and unacceptable injustice, and one that's costing us something precious. And that's the challenge that we've accepted in Vancouver. Uh, we've done some things right, we've done some wrong, we've may, maybe moved too fast at times and, and uh, got some bumps and bruises from that. And, uh, and at the same time, we're making good progress on this. We've stopped the growth in homelessness and we're starting to reverse it. We've mobilized a ton of resources, we've mustered the political will, we uh, have innovated, we've partnered, we've persevered, we've been bold. And we've drawn a lot of inspiration and ideas and wisdom from many of you in this room and, and, and your efforts right across the country. Although our work done is not, is not done across Canada, we, uh, there are still tens of thousands of people who will be sleeping outside tonight. We can also look at it, the frame from 99.4% of Canadians will not experience homelessness this year. That 0.6% are the people who will suffer from this. And so that shouldn't look impossible. Solving uh, homelessness for 0.6% of Canada, we're almost all of the, the way there if you look at it by that measurement. And last month, uh, you know, last month we, we celebrated Reconciliation Week in Vancouver. We had over 70,000 people in Vancouver participating and celebrating reconciliation. And, and I think it, it's fair to say that Canadians are ashamed of the brutal injustices that were inflicted upon Aboriginal children and their families and communities for generations. It's something that looked absolutely impossible to change for over a century in this country is now seeing the light of day and is transforming. And I hope that Canadians in the future look back at this period, uh, this time of homelessness and untreated mental illness and addiction in the same way, as a travesty that has no place in a humane or caring society. You know, um, as a nation, we, we like to celebrate the Grand Slam home run in the bottom of the ninth. We, we love the big overtime goal. But ending homelessness is not quite like that. It's, uh, it's centimeter by centimeter. It's one person at a time. And, and we need to celebrate those victories one at a time. We need to celebrate the small ones and the big ones when they do come. Because every person in this country is worth, worth celebrating. Every life is worth uh, celebrating. Every human being deserves a home and the support that, uh, that comes with that. And every community has a responsibility to meet. Now, your work is profoundly, positively impacting this country. And uh, it's not recognized nearly enough. It needs to be celebrated because we are going to get there. And I want to thank you again uh, with all of my heart for 
helping our country uh, in that greater obligation to help each other and to create victories that are well worth celebrating each and every day for every one of us. So thank you again for all your work and here's to solving homelessness. Thank you. Merci à tous. Thank you.